Excellent, great. Um, I think let's start. Uh, it is now on the hour. It's 7 p.m. in Cape Town. Um, it's 1 p.m. on on the East Coast. And Ted, what time is it on, on your side of the USA? Oh yeah, it's 10 o'clock, so it's good. Okay, that's absolutely yeah. great. We are recording the session. So if anybody arrives late, what they can do is that they can watch the recording of the session. So um, Ted, I'd like, to, I'd, I'd like to welcome you, Ted Tagami, our co-collaborator on the CTE CubeSat mission. And uh, this evening as well, we are joined by William Edmondson, who is co-host, and he's going to be assisting us with seeing if there are any questions. Um, and also, Bianca Gottfriedson is also co-host this evening. And uh, after Ted's uh, uh, session, what, what we're going to be covering is um, certainly everything to do with uh, different types of communication and radio solutions for your for your CubeSats, um, as well as understanding uh, budgets, radio budgets, uh, communication budgets, and all of that kind of thing. So, um, Ted, uh, what I'd like to do is I'd like to hand over to you. Uh, if it's okay, um, we have we've set aside a thirty minutes for you. So we're probably going to get a number of questions. Mm -hmm. um for you if that's okay and oh, would sure. you prefer that we interrupt you or um for, for questions or um uh, would you would you like to uh maybe take questions in the middle and at the end oh uh, hey that's so that's a good idea i guess what i'll do is i'll do a little preamble uh and kind of set it in motion and then um we'll welcome questions throughout i will have to cut out about 25 after the hour uh, to get ready for a 10 30. That's absolutely great. That's perfect. Um, Ted, yes, thank you very much for joining us. And um, for myself, uh, as, um, as somebody who's learning a, a lot every day about CubeSats, you know, what I was wondering about is in terms of the, the, the teachers, the schools, the students that you've engaged with over many years now, um, maybe what is, the, what is the biggest challenge that's been overcome? You know, what is the biggest challenge that people feel that they're going to have and may not necessarily in terms of let's let's take away the mystery. Let's dissolve mm -hmm. all the mystery and all of those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. And then also perhaps what you feel has been the greatest success of any group uh, who have been able to launch um, a mission uh, into mm -hmm. orbit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Over to you. Oh. Over to you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, thank you for inviting me. Uh, and so uh, what's great about X in a Box is you guys are very technical. Uh, and so for anyone that's kind of joining you in these conferences, you will get a really keen insight in what's possible from the engineering perspective, your different sensors, your components, how they relate to power, communications, et cetera. Uh, and I guess I'll be more conceptual in our thinking. Uh, it's, um, you know, putting together a CubeSat has become uh, much more easy today than it was, say, two decades ago, uh, when the CubeSat form factor was essentially established. Um, and uh, I think uh, what uh, if we think about assembling a CubeSat, it's getting much closer to putting together uh, like a PC computer. Uh, so if you've ever assembled uh, your own computer uh, for gaming or what have you, uh, it's not dissimilar to that. Um, there are other things to take into consideration. Uh, you don't put your PC in a rocket with vibration and acceleration under forces of gravity uh, and then radiation and what have you. So uh, the preparation for the space flight is pretty paramount. Uh, I think uh, from anecdotally anyway, I, we haven't worked with a student team that's actually been to space uh, in with a satellite. We generally run experiments aboard the International Space Station which makes it a little easier. We've got that uh, something larger than a football field weighing some you know, three quarters of a million uh, uh, pounds, it, you know, massive uh, piece of equipment up there, uh, which we don't have to worry about a navigation or orientation or anything like that. So we have a nice, uh, comfortable environment which you can put our experiments on. So it's been easier for us as we ramp it up. I'm assuming all of you here are in high school now or working with high school students. 
Um, and the challenge really is that, that, that desire to move quickly and just to see it working. Uh, and then also taking the care to make sure that it functions properly. So vibration testing, thermal testing, uh, redundancies, double, triple checking. Um, often uh, when you hear about failure, uh, it's a failure of a very simple thing that should have been taken care of on the ground. So um, something I learned back uh, when I was in art school and uh, working as a carpenter on the side to kind of pay my way through school was to measure something twice before you made a single cut. And so before you fly, you're even in a prototype or here terrestrially on earth and maybe in the stratosphere, uh, you're gonna want to really double and triple check everything that you do. How you interoperate with your teams is important as well. So the simplest thing like a, literally a loose screw or wire can fail your mission. And if it takes several years to be prepared to get that flight authorization, to have that payload covered in some degree to get in orbit, to be deployed probably, probably from a P-pod deployer on the space station or maybe some other mechanism, to have it fail because uh, a wire wasn't soldered properly or the programming was done incorrectly. A last minute code change uh, is drastic. It's, it's, uh, it's really disappointing. There are sometimes things outside of your control like a rocket blowing up on the pad as well, but for the most part, it's in the hands of you students and you as teachers to make sure that everything is done on, on, on the ground here to the best uh, of the really and triply checking everything. Uh, often you'll have two devices that you build, an engineering unit and a flight unit, and they're interoperable. Either one could be the flight candidate, but you end up selecting one of those. And the benefit of that is you have a, a replicated device. It costs you a little bit more, but also keep in mind it's taking you a couple years to get to that point. If there's a failure on the pad, uh, the disaster happens and the rocket is lost, your two years of work is now lost. Now you might've been insured or what have you, but you still have taken your couple years of work and it's gone away. If you have your engineering unit, you now are flight ready, you can go again. Uh, but more practically, that's a very rare event, is when you're in operations and you're in orbit and something goes wrong. Uh, invariably it will. Uh, maybe the orientation isn't correct in your satellite, you're not getting full power. Maybe there's a problem with your antenna not deploying properly if it's a mechanical device. You've got your engineering unit that's the twin of what you've got in orbit and you can start debugging what that possible problem might be. Uh, hopefully it's something that can be resolved by looking at your engineering unit and you can then apply that, I would hope, to your, your flight unit would be good. Uh, I'll do a little history and then um, uh, in terms of how we got to where we are, I'll introduce our uh, little simple uh, sensor shield that fits on our, our Arduino. Uh, it's much less complex than all of the myriad of opportunities that X in a Box can provide you, but I think it's also a simple on-ramp. But going back a little ways, uh, uh, I think if, if all of you are in high school here, uh, just before you were born, uh, the International Space Station kind of got and put into orbit uh, this year's its 20th anniversary. And right around that time, just in the late 90s, uh, the precursor to the modern CubeSat was developed. It happened at Stanford. Uh, Professor Bob Twiggs, some of you may know, or you've heard of Professor Twiggs, was a, a professor at Stanford, and his students were working on uh, building and uh, constructing a satellite to put into orbit. And back then, you're looking at a size, maybe of a small like dorm refrigerator. Uh, and they were getting frustrated because uh, they were graduating from school before that satellite was actually completed. And of course, the professor is getting a little disappointed as well. So uh, at a symposium, I think it was in Hawaii, he gave everyone a challenge. And if you know Professor Twiggs, you can see why this makes sense. Professor Twiggs loves to drink soda, and he almost invariably has a soda near him. So just on the podium, he holds up a soda can. I wasn't there, but this is what I've heard directly from him and from others. And he basically holds up his soda can and he challenges, uh, challenges everyone if they can put a satellite in the volume of this soda can. About 300 grams mass, uh, you know, whatever the diameter is, 55 by 122 centimeters. And says, you know, can you do that? And everyone just, in a way, almost laughing. This is, that's crazy, right? And he's suggesting here to build essentially a simulated satellite. Because uh, if you can go through all the steps and processes before you build your actual one, you have a high rate of iteration and design thinking, you can plan for things, and you can see your failure points. And there's a lot of learning going on. So for a fraction of the cost and time, they did that. And this CanSat 
and they took that out to the Black Rock Desert and they launched it in a rocket. Now that rocket didn't leave the earth. Uh, it didn't go past the Carmen line up 60 some odd miles. But uh, what they did do is they went just a couple miles and it was deployed. So this CANSAT was ejected and its parachute came out and its hang time as it came down from its, uh, its altitude uh, uh, was essentially equivalent in time to as if a satellite had gone from the horizon line to the horizon line if it was in a low earth orbit. Uh, and so that was a perfect a analog to an actual experiment. Uh, if you think about radio communications in your ground station and just generally testing your equipment, vibration on a launch, et cetera. Uh, and so from that, uh, um, about a year later, uh, a professor down at Cal Poly, both of these universities in California, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, uh, Professor Jordi Pug Siarig, uh, who now uh, is still a professor there. Uh, Twiggs is retired from Stanford. Uh, he's he, uh, Jordi created a group called Tyvek, which is a world-class satellite developer now. And a lot of those graduate students at Cal Poly are involved in, in research and designing of these satellites. But they came up with uh, the modern satellite standard, this 10 centimeter cube weighing about 1.3 kilograms. Uh, and so, you know, this is a flight unit that would go, uh, this is a lab, but this is the same volume, uh, you know, the 10 centimeter cube. This is the labs that we put up uh, on the space station or in volumes like this. So this became uh, the, the modern satellite. And when that was deployed or was proposed, uh, all of your major uh, uh, industry titans just thought that was debris in space. How could you expect to, uh, to do something like that uh, and, um, and create uh, uh, a meaningful experiment? Uh, but with the miniaturization of technology, they were able to do it. And within just a few short years, everyone in industry uh, from your largest satellite manufacturers down to startups moved to this form factor because they knew they could launch for a relatively low cost. Uh, at that time, I guess under a quarter million dollars, you could probably put something in the orbit. You can get those costs down significantly uh, lower than that today. Uh, launch cost is your big cost. Um, NASA has some programs you might be aware of, like the CubeSat Launch Initiative. There are other opportunities as well. Uh, but really, it comes down to your design what it is that you want to observe or measure. And from that, thinking about the engineering. So before I kind of open that up, I just want to say that uh, from the direction that I come from is an inspiration perspective. Uh, use your imagination. If you think about Earth, this planetary body orbiting a star, um, what is it that you have an interest in? What is it that you want to observe? Uh, and it could be something uh, very uh, Earth-based uh, from the standpoint of uh, you know, uh, uh, um, climate change or uh, animals going through their, uh, their normal migration patterns. Uh, you could look at changes in temperature uh, in the ocean. Think about sp sped, spread spectra uh, capabilities. Uh, but as you look at all these things, one thing you'll, you'll come across if you do get past your prototype into flight qualifications, is you're going to need to take anywhere from six months to two years getting approvals from different organizations. And here in the United States, you're going to need to get approval from the FCC for your radio licensing. It sounds like the back end of this uh, conversation will be about radio communications and radio budgets, uh, but you'll need to get approval from the FCC. And if you plan on any kind of earth observation, uh, think about just visual camera or you know, something maybe more broad spectra, you're going to get, need to get approval through NOAA, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, because they basically manage uh, uh, and are responsible for uh, the ability for anyone to observe Earth if you're launching from here in the United States. And that might go back as more of an archaic thing from the military's perspective and looking at uh, uh, um, uh, secret bases and what have you. Uh, but that is a consideration. So uh, FCC and NOAA are approvals that can take a long period of time. Something you don't need to worry about in this design competition. I would say focus more on that thing that's interesting to you. Maybe it's the South Atlantic anomaly, this magnetic field uh, that we have around Earth has an unusual openness there east of Brazil in the South Atlantic, uh, and it fluctuates over the seasons. That's kind of interesting. Why does it do that? So if you're gonna fly a magnetometer, how would you do that and not have the magnetometer interrupted by your electronics, for example? Uh, you can think about the altitude changes. And uh, if you're thinking about something 
uh, uh, more atmospheric. Um, there's very little information really gathered from the exosphere, the really kind of edge of our atmosphere. Typically uh, on descent when a, uh, when a, uh, a satellite is deorbiting, uh, you lose your communications uh, because of the temperature and some other issues. Uh, but getting uh, readings in that uh, upper atmosphere, the really extreme parts of our atmosphere, are still a lot of unknowns. And so that's kind of interesting research capabilities. So use your imagination, keep it broad and open. For this design challenge, as far as I can understand, it really is about the creativity of what you're coming up with. The me mechanical component, I think, is going to be less of a challenge in the prototype phase. It will, you'll definitely confront it when you get to the, hey, we really want to do this. We really want to put a satellite in space. So quickly here, I'll just end with, uh, what did I do with it? I just had it here. It is. I had it out here. So many of you are probably familiar with the Arduino microcontroller. I've just got one here mounted inside a, a printed uh, shell that's a, equivalent to a, a can. I took the top off. But I wanted to show you is the shield that we've developed. Uh, and so it's pre-built. This allows you to focus more on the programming. And what I did is I removed two things. I removed the GPS antenna and communications off the top of the board so you could see the board in a little better detail. Uh, and I also removed the, the radios that we use typically for ground communications. This is an XB a Pro, uh, which um, 900 megahertz uh, allows us a communication about 28 mile range. Good for our rockets, uh, reasonable for our high altitude balloons. If you're getting up in the stratosphere, you're gonna get maybe the first 30 minutes uh, up to an hour or so of your flight uh, telemetry back down to earth without having to require any kind of licensing. But our board itself, you can see those beige uh, boxes. There are breakouts, four pin connectors. It's easy to add additional sensors to it, no soldering required. And you have your basic components already built in, things that are typical for a more terrestrial-based experiment, a magnetometer, an accelerometer, uh, a light sensor, uh, barometric pressure, temperature, and humidity. It does have a real-time clock and it has a data card for recording all this information. And with those breakouts, you could add CO2, uh, um, uh, uh, infrared, a uh, camera. So other things you can add and trigger off of uh, something as simple as a $20, $25 Arduino board. So that's kind of an intro. I'll be quiet here, maybe listen to some questions you guys might have. Uh, maybe there's some in the chat, but Judy, back to you. Great. Ted, thank you very much. And uh, yes, you're very right. There are multiple challenges in getting the FCC approval. Um, next week on Tuesday, uh, Mike Miller is joining us from Stirk. And so he's going to take us through what are all those requirements that we need to start considering. Uh, uh, so that when we do, when we actually even think about our design, we have, we, we bear the end in mind. Um, great. So there is one question here. Um, from Robert, um, why make a shield when an SMD microcontroller could be easily integrated into the device while also lowering weight and more efficient size? Oh, absolutely. Uh, so there's a couple of reasons why we built the shield for the Arduino. One is the near ubiquity of the Arduino Uno. Uh, and so if we look at classrooms around the world. Many of them will not be doing what you guys are proposing to do. Uh, build a prototype satellite, and perhaps even launch your own. So how can we, if we think about what they, in the industry, they call a flat sat, how can you give uh, the greatest number of students access conceptually to what a, a, a satellite might be able to do? And so by preparing a system like this, we're able to go into the uh, more traditional environments, not an after school program or a club, but literally in your physics class, your chemistry class, your biology class and introduce instruments that everyone can use immediately. And so it was a primary function. Also from the standpoint of cost, you're looking at something that you can add for about $150. That is, you're pretty much getting your instrumentation running right away. If you think about it from a prototype standpoint, if you want to rewrite your code, you've got a good base to work from. So I would say definitely apples and oranges. If you want that flexibility of being able to scale and go in any direction, if you're really wanting to mount something on a PC-104 standard, then you're gonna be looking at something like an X in the box uh, configuration where you've got those components. If you want to have uh, a quicker access to perhaps thinking more about the code and less about uh, all the variables and you really just want to see a proof of principle, 
then something like our shield has that type of functionality. And there's ways you can bridge off of that as well. Uh, if you really wanna get into PC board design, breadboarding and do your own custom boards, that's wholly possible. There are manufacturers throughout the United States that will, that will build a custom board for you. Um, and then maybe you solder your components on it or you put them in the, in the oven there and you kind of bake your components on. So those are options as well. But what we try to do is open it to the broadest number of students at the lowest possible cost um, with, uh, really, I think the, the roadblock is many educators uh, are inhibited. I think if you're a student watching this, or if you're a teacher, you're kind of at, at that 1%, kind of 5% of schools that have those capabilities. And that, I guess that's why you're here listening to, to uh, what Judy and uh, Yarka have to say. Ted, thank you very much. And um, please, can you, can you share with everybody um, where, they can, where they can follow you um, I, I follow your uh, high altitude balloon missions around the globe on, on Facebook. So, uh, yeah, if, um, if you can just uh, share, uh, mention to everybody uh, where, where, they can, where they can follow you. Judy, mm -hmm. just before that, there's another question. So I thought we should maybe just get that answered first. Sure. So there's a question here whether um, uh, it says, can we use this with the Raspberry Pi 4? Or is it for Arduino only, Arduino Uno only? Right, right. It's just designed for the Arduino Uno. Uh, people have been asking us to build a hat for the Raspberry Pi. Uh, one of our instruments that we run on the space station is called Exolab. It's a small, it's a 2U equivalent, so two of those cubes in, in its volume. And we grow plants in microgravity and bacteria, and we do some research on the, on the uh, astrobotany front. Uh, but we run a Raspberry Pi for that and the engineering there, you know, CO2, temp and humidity, we're in the, uh, in, uh, aboard the space station, so we don't need to worry about navigation or solar power or anything like that. But people have asked for the hat, uh, and I guess we could probably move in that direction. But when we see, you know, like X in the box and other components that are out there, they have those flexibilities. Um, I think we've been comfortable with the Arduino Uno. That's something I guess we can consider. As a startup, you have to kind of pick your battles. And a lot of our work is actually now done on the space station. But that's a great question. I think the Pi is probably, uh, as we've seen it uh, over, over time, it being a small computer versus, say, a microcontroller, gives you a lot of uh, added functionality. And I think there's some, a lot of interest there. That's a good, a good question. And then uh, <clears throat> the final one here, are you also working on the Astro, Astro Pi missions on the ISS? Oh, so the Astro Pi, we're not. That's out of the UK. Uh, 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 Matt Richardson uh, is the director of Raspberry Pi Foundation here in the U.S. Uh, and I think they're trying to find a collaboration to do something in the United States as well. One thing I'll, I'll leave you guys with is um, we are guest scientists on a se robot series that's on the space station right now just being commissioned called Astro Bees. Now, the nice thing about the Astro Bees, it's a very open-ended platform. and uh, It's a 30-centimeter cube. It's a free flyer. It's got some fans that can move around the space station. Stanford, MIT, some other companies have put sensors and instruments on it. Uh, and so we've got uh, now these, uh, uh, this technology we're putting on the robot. We're adding a digital nose <laughs> to the robot. So it's gonna be smelling gases and microgravity. Gases and fluids behave completely differently in a microgravity environment than they do here on Earth or any other kind of gravitational body. Uh, and so that's just some investigations we're going to be doing there. Um, but uh, yeah, I guess hopefully that answers that question. Great. As far as reaching out, uh, Judy, yes. uh, you can reach us just at magnitude.io. Magnitude. Uh, you can find us on Facebook, magnitude.io without a dot. Uh, YouTube, magnitude.io without the dot. You can see our channel. Uh, we do, uh, I have a dozen uh, around the world balloon attempts uh, planned for this year, uh, this school year rather. Next one is supposed to go up in October. Uh, we are using a device uh, that is um, only weighing about 12 grams uh, through, uh, constructed by a NASA engineer uh, out of Huntsville, Alabama. He's been flying balloons for about 30 years. Uh, there are some tools that we want to add to this, uh, slow scan TV, going to a uh, 30 meter band radio communications um, so we can actually get broadcasting over the oceans. Um, but that's a fun experience. It's designed for our younger students to inspire them. Uh, and we bring in interdisciplinary studies 
history, uh, geology, sociology, uh, atmospheric sciences, really everything under the sun, <laughs> literally, uh, with this balloon. It's really designed as an inspiration. And then uh, the pandemic aside, we typically work with uh, schools across the country uh, and student teams to design, build, launch, and recover their payloads uh, in high altitude balloons. Keeping it under uh, a couple kilograms, uh, the, uh, the FAA is comfortable with that. Uh, you need to have some, there's some restrictions around the high altitude balloons. We have the students contacting the FAA, filing a notice to airmen. So there's a really end to end experience. We've had students running the entire program themselves with our guidance as young as the seventh grade level. You might be able to bring it down to the sixth grade level, but uh, I've stunned okay. her. I, I talk too fast. <laughs> okay. Uh, she's just told me she's um, mm -hmm. she's back now. I think she just had a, a hiccup here. Let's see. Yes. Hi. Hi, everyone. I think uh, I probably drove over the, the cable or something. <laughs> uh, all right. I'm going to have to kind of wrap it up here in a minute. That's I really apologize. Perfect. I can't stay long. I'm seeing a couple other questions here, though. Uh, the, uh, the shield isn't open source, but the code is. Um, uh, so uh, I guess that answers that question. Um, parts wise, I guess if you wanna uh, put the parts together and, and build your own, uh, I think it's fairly simple. Your parts are gonna probably cost you more than the board itself. That was our objective is to reduce the cost. If you're interested in this program, uh, I haven't really worked on any kind of discount pricing, but I can do something special for you. You could just mention the CubeSat challenge. Uh, uh, there is a collaboration for UAE, absolutely. Uh, outside of this competition, we really work with students around the world, whether in Romania, Germany, Kenya, South Africa, Japan, Canada, Mexico. I mean, we've got them all over the place. Mostly it's domestic here in the U.S. Uh, but if you have a program that you'd like to kind of move forward with, we can work with you on it. I do know that what X in the Box has provided, their platform is very flexible. A lot of opportunities. There's so many amazing things you can do with it. So I encourage you, you know, it's like a friendly competitor, I guess. We're all trying to do the same thing, advanced learning and education. So I'm, uh, I'm really uh, grateful to be able to join in and say hello with you folks. But I, I, I changed my name in, in the chat here to my email address. Please feel free to reach out. If you do, just in the subject line, if you can put CT, CTE CubeSat, I know what it's related to. And so I can prioritize it uh, that way. Um, but Judy, back over to you. I'm going to have to jump off here in just a minute. Um, if there's any last things you want to say. Great. Ted, thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Uh, sorry, we've taken a, a little bit more of your time. And uh, thank you. We're going to send you a copy of the video. And um, we're probably going to invite you back again uh, in the well, next Well, if I can make it, <laughs> I'm more than happy to. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, just a uh, you know, quick full disclosure. I'm not a scientist or an engineer, I'm an art guy. Uh, and it starts with your creativity and your inspiration. And I think many of your students uh, and you as teachers understand and realize that. So it starts with what makes, what drives you, what gets you excited. Once you've discovered what that you need to do, you need to work with folks like Judy and Bjarka to really find the right tools to solve that thing you wanna get done. Maybe it's a robot arm or maybe it's a CubeSat in orbit whatever it might be, uh, there are folks out there like X in a Box and our company like Mag Magnitude. There are many, many others that can help you in your mission, whatever it might be. So I welcome you to the journey. I know it's just your few first steps and I'm really looking forward to seeing what comes out of this uh, program. Probably the most important thing is the program won't end just because you are selected or you aren't selected. Mm -hmm. It only ends when you want it to end. So yeah. where you want to take it's wholly up to you guys. So I wish you all the best. I hope to hear from you all. And Judy, thank you. Yarka, thank you for inviting me. And I thank you, Ted. To thank you very, very people. much for joining Thank you very much, Ted. Have right. a great evening, a great morning, wherever you may be in the world. Yeah. yeah. All right, take care. Thanks. 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 Cheers. Bye. Um, Bjarke, can I, can I hand over to you?
uh, to take us through uh, communications, radios, radio budgets. Yes, absolutely. Um, thank you, Judy. Um, so let me start with sharing my screen here. Let's see how this goes. So um, um, I assume, Judy, you can see what uh, what I have on my screen here. Um, yes. So just confirmed, good. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, satellite systems, and uh, I'm going to just spend uh, the last half hour here on on a, on a very specific part of this thing here. But before I do that, I just want to um, get into the different satellite subsystems. So you will hear when, you, when, we, when we talk about satellite, and CubeSat especially, that uh, there's a lot of, uh, of acronyms that have been used. And there's not necessarily a standard behind acronyms, but uh, it's kind of like expected you know some of them. So I have a, a few examples here. So for example, the ATS is attitude determination system. So attitude, that's where, the way you point. Uh, so the satellite, you know, if there's a camera on, you want to have it pointing towards ground. If you have a directional antenna for radio communication, you want to have it to point uh, towards uh, your, your ground station and so on. Uh, sometimes also called ATCS and the C is for control. And that is that if you not only want to determine what direction your satellite points, but you also want to control it, so you want to move it uh, so it turns to the right of the way, then you have uh, um, uh, both the attitude determination system and a control system to, to move it. I'm going to talk about that in another session. Then there's electric power system, that's kind of like uh, very important in a satellite. It's something we just take for granted for many other times because we can always just clock our stuff in or charge it. Uh, when it comes to a satellite, you um, only have power from your uh, stored power from your batteries, and hopefully you can reach out that with solar panel. But that is, uh, in, in our part of the world, the early options. There has been bigger, you know, satellites, commercial satellites that use oil uh, power system than solar power, but uh, this is what uh, almost all satellites on Earth has been built uh, by schools and university are based on. Then you have the communication system. Now, so remember when you set a satellite into space, then uh, you're not getting it back again. So it doesn't really help you store the data on a SD card or something like that. It burns up in the atmosphere. And uh, if you don't have a radio and a downlink, so a communication from your satellite down to your ground station where you can receive the data, well, then it's just a brick you put in space. And that's one of the big problems there is, is that if um, if you if you don't have power or you lose radio communication, the antenna doesn't unfold and so on, then you can't talk to the satellite, and then it doesn't it's going to do nothing for you. Then it's just space junk. Then there's terms like, for example, TT and C telemetric tracking or command subsystem, and the CTHS or CTH command and data handling system onboard computer. All those systems, some use the one term, some use the other term, but Many times it's just been, hey, this is the computer. This is the one that kind of like control what we're doing. And then we have payload. And payload is not the rest of the subsystems here. So I have another angle where I discuss the payload versus the rest. And I'm using this. By the way, before I go further, I'm going to talk about the communication system um, uh, after the next slide. But what I want to talk about here is that when we look at this thing from a, I call it from a space stem point of view. So I have these three axes that uh, are angles that I look at. I have the X axis. This is a subsystem. This is what I want to call the engineering part of a satellite. So this is like if you compare to your vehicle, your Uber driver. <clears throat> this is the car that takes you from the one place to another. So that is your communication system, your elect uh, electrical power system, your attitude control, all your computer, the whole thing. That is the stuff that just has to be there. It's engineering, which means that it's not necessarily new stuff. It's like something you tested, it works, it's been used before. And it's that part that makes sure that when you fly, it works. And then you have your payload, that's your science, that's your experiment, this is the new stuff. So that can be sensors like a radiation sensor, uh, or like a magnometer, as, as I said, just talked about. It can be a camera, it can be a 
multispectral camera. It could be a biological experiment where you want to see how something grow in um, in microgravity. But it could also be a new radio, for example. So when you want to test a new radio, you will have a radio you already know up in your subsystems, and your payload will then be your new radio where you test that. And maybe in a flight in the future, you will put that. So in our little uh, example here with the Uber driver, then the payload is the passenger, and maybe one day he becomes an Uber driver himself. So <clears throat> that's your X and Z axis, and then I have this Y axis, which is kind of like this distance. Now, many when universities say we're going to build a satellite, they kind of like already have said, no, it has to fly that altitude. And I build one on the table, test it on the table, and maybe test it a few other places and then launch it into space. What's the interesting route here is that how do you get from your idea and then eventually get into space? But once you're in space, that's actually more or less the end of the journey because from there on, it's just downloading data. Building the satellites, testing it, getting to work, testing in different environments, you know, getting up on higher, higher altitudes. You know, so first you have it on table, maybe you put it on a drone, maybe you put it on a party balloon, then you get it on the high altitude balloon or like a, um, um, a sounding rocket or a suborbital rocket, and eventually you maybe launch it into space. Um, <clears throat> maybe it's so great that uh, you get a flight, so you have it as a satellite around an hour, um, um body like Mars or, or, or the moon or even further. So, so that's the different ways of looking at this thing here. So what, what X in the box is very much is about is that the subsystem. We have a lot of sensors for your payloads. Um, and we, we try to kind of like look at this thing here as you're building a satellite. So it's not like, um, it's, it's, it's more like the idea with the X chips is that you, you build a satellite. So we're not trying to have a, not something that final. We have something that is, that when you click it together, it's uh, it's easy to put it together and you can change different components. So you can say, well, we have a number of different temperature sensors, for example, not that necessarily super useful in space, depending on what you're missing with temperature on, but we have different IMUs. So IMU is like accelerometer, magnometer, uh, gyroscope. Um, we have maybe some light sensors. We have a, you know infrared temperature sensor. There are a lot of different uh, sensors you can put on board. And we also have different ratios. We have different, uh, uh, power systems, and, and you can then kind of reconstruct that. And maybe also important here is that we have different kind of computer systems. As uh, um, you maybe have seen in the video, um, uh, that you can you know put a, a Raspberry Pi on your satellite here, and we have like a breakout board, um, um, they called it HAT because that's when you have a board that fits the standard Raspberry Pi. We have a little, much smaller breakout board, so I wouldn't necessarily call it a HAT. So we call it a bridge. And we have the same for a lot of other um, um, MCUs. So we have like for, for Arduino series style MCUs, but you can program in Python. We have other modules you can program in Python. We have something you can program in Make code. So you have a lot of different opportunities depending on how advanced your class is and how much you want. And of course, we also have, like if you go for the XK90 kits, we also have ready-made software that allow you to just put the software on, configure it, and then fly it, and then start with something that, that works before you start, um, you know, digging into the program. So communication. Um, so this is gonna be a, a kind of like a little hectic um, a, a 20 minutes, 22 minutes on, on communication here. But remember, this is recorded, so you can watch it again. Um, you're welcome to ask questions, and if I can't answer them all at the end of this session here, I can hopefully answer them later stage. So communication is one part of it. This is the radio. You want to talk to your satellite because you can't get the data unless you use a radio. Of course, if you put it up in a weather balloon, and the kits, the XK90 does actually have an SD card where I also store the data. So if you put it on a drone or weather balloon, you can get the data there. The radio is not strictly necessary that way. But since we are simulating that we are play, we're building a real satellite, the idea is actually that we want the radio to work. So a little bit background here on radios, and then we get into the juicy stuff. So there's a lot of radios and a lot of radio frequencies. And one of the reasons for that 
is that the world uh, cannot agree necessarily on one frequency. So the International Telecommunications Union, ITU, is a world body for all kinds of communication, whether it's a fax or it's internet or it's uh, um, wireless communication or GSM or uh, any, a normal telephony. They're like um, the, the overall body. And then there's uh, in, uh, you know, sub bodies for different regions and for, for different countries. So region one is, is uh, time zone zero. So that's going through UK and, and it's kind of like uh, then uh, Europe and Africa and the Middle East and a lot of the countries uh, um, in, in what's now uh, recognized in Asia, that was all part of uh, the old Soviet Union and Soviet Union back uh, uh, in the old days was seen as part of Europe. Um, so when that split up, a lot of the countries there are still part of it. Uh, the Americas, uh, Latin America, North America, Central America, the Americas, uh, ITU region two, and then the rest of the world is region three. And the rest of the world is not 100% uh, aligned on the frequency. So in ITU region one, we have one frequency for what we call the ISM band. This is a license-free radio frequency we can use. And in America, there's another one. Now, actually in Africa and Europe, in ITU region one, we have two frequencies because we first had one and then Americas had another one and we want to have something that was close to the Americas frequency also so we could just share one antenna. So <clears throat> uh, we have one frequency that's global that works in all the regions, and that's 2.4 gigahertz. We, we have more than one, but 2.4 gigahertz is the one that most of you know, because that is the frequency your Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and Zigbee and Threat and a lot of these different communication protocols that you have in your home, they run on 2.4 gigahertz. And yes, it's in your home because the, the higher frequencies are 2.4 gigahertz, 2,400 megahertz, the higher it is, the more data you can transfer the faster I can transfer data, but uh, it has, um, it has, uh, it, um, um, it, it, it have a, um, a limitation of how far it can reach. So if you want to have a signal that can go very far, you have to have a much lower frequency. So low frequency is long range, but less data and high frequency. So for example, a uh, new Wi-Fi standard with 5 gigahertz means that you can send even faster data with a 5 gigahertz uh, signal. <coughs> so we have, sorry about that, we have a set of radios. We have ILO1, ILO2, and ILO3. And that is linked later on in my presentation here to those three radios. We also have three radios, CR1, 2, and 3, and they have a built-in Arduino Uno. So the same size, the X chip, they have antenna, the whole thing but they have like an Arduino Uno built in. So if you have like, you want to use a library other than ours, and then the CR is very nice because you can then use their libraries and program it, and you can still use that to communicate with one of the other <coughs> cores that you want to use. Uh, we use the ILO one, and there's a converter chip one that converted to the bus standard we use. And, uh, and that's the one uh, in, in the kit you're getting. So, um, uh, in the US, when you buy the XK90 kit, you get two of the RLO3 radios. So that's a 915 megahertz, and that's a license free, so you can use it without um, you know, asking for permission. It's the same as your garage door opener I work with, and you can see there on the right hand side that's region two. In Europe, uh, you get the XK90 with the RLO2, and that's 868. It's very close, and you can see it uses the same module. So if you get the ILO2, you still just tell that you want to run 915 megahertz and it works fine. But the ILO2 was mainly made for, for reading one and ILO3 reading three. And ILO1 was the uh, originally frequency that was used in Europe. So you can see that is half the speed of the ILO2, sorry, half the frequency of the ILO2. So uh, it has a couple of advances because that frequency is also within the amateur radio frequency. And I'm going to talk much more about that. But let's get into some of the other columns so we can start doing a little bit of calculation here. So we transmit with 20 dBm. So, and that's the same as 100 milliwatt. And the reason why we say dBm and not 100 milliwatt is because when we want to do our link budget, then if we calculate in dB, 
then we can simply just add the different values together. So it's much easier to calculate that way. But it also kind of like gives an idea about how powerful or how much power we have to use and where in our link bot that we have to focus. Now, the reason why we say minus 148 when we listen is because that is the loss on a radio. So in the old days, when you had a radio and you received something, there was a loss in transmission and you receive it. That has changed completely. Now you gain a lot when you receive the signal. So we say minus 148 because when we calculate it in the formula, it will say minus uh, your receiver uh, sensitivity. And because it's minus already, it becomes in plus. So minus minus 148, so plus 148. So therefore, with, with our radio, with sending with 20 and receiving with 148, it will say it have a link budget of 168 dB in those radio sets. A lot of oil comes in, and this is what we're going to talk about. But when we send with 100 milliwatt, that is the same as 20 dB. Now, you can see if we send with 200 milliwatt, so we use double the amount of energy, and this is the energy that comes from the battery and solar panel and all that kind of stuff, we only get 3 dB more. So you can already see there, getting 3 dB more for double the power consumption versus that we can receive, one, one, uh, uh, receive 148. It is the 148 that's really the benefit with these radios. It's not how much it can send them. So when we talk about LoRa as low power, it's because it actually transmits with a low power and then it has a very good sensitivity when listening. It's actually so good a sensitivity on the radio that it's only exceeded by a, um, a TPS radio that is better than this. But otherwise, compared to other radios, these are the best listening, listening radio states out there. So I just want to give you a couple other. If you say, for example, one watt, that's 10 times the power you have to transmit with, and you only get, you're only going from 20 to 30 dB. So, and then I just want to add this uh, last one here because I'm going to show you an antenna that gives you 11 dB in difference. And you can see that's the same as the difference between 100 milliwatts and 1.3 uh, watts in, in, in difference if you have the right antenna. So that's a little bit about transmission power and a little bit about reception power. Let's go on here. So the LoRa, just when we, um, before we continue with, with the calculation here, is that it chirps spread spectrum radio. What that means is that it kind of like transmits and receives on multiple different frequencies at a time. And it does that because it kind of like makes sure that if there's some noise, it doesn't get into, uh, it, it, it's not like locked to one frequency and then have to wait till the noise removes or things like that. So it will talk on these different frequencies and you, you don't have to, consider any of this thing here. That's all happening in the background. <coughs> Sorry, it's all happening in the background, but it, it uses a lot of different frequency in that frequency band that you're allowed to use. It's low power and LoRa it stands for long range. Now, if you wanna know more about the different frequencies in detail, then the Sync Network here, which is a LoRa band, which I'm gonna talk about a little bit later on, have like excellent frequency plans for all the different countries. So the link is there on the bottom of the document. And then antenna. So antenna is very important in this thing here. So I'm going in a little detail here. So if you want to build your own antenna, you are aware of this thing here. And building your own antenna is a really good idea and a really good exercise uh, because um, the antenna theory and things like that is, is easy to get to. So first of all, there's different kind of connectors. And the one you just have to make sure you avoid is those that's called RP-SMA. We are using the SMA connector, which is a standard, but sometimes when you go out and buy a connector, you might end up with one of the other ones thinking that you have the right one because it says male. So you can see if you take a male RP-SMA and a female SMA, yes, they can you can screw them together, but there's no connection between the two. So the stuff you have to get is the male connector, the male SMA. If you buy an antenna, uh, you get antenna with your kit, but if you want to build your own antenna, or you want to buy a separate antenna because you want to have a better signal, then make sure you get a male SMA. Our radios have the female SMA sitting on the X-chip. 
Okay, so you go and buy an antenna. So this is, for example, from GDP. You can buy them many different places. And this is the antenna that, um, um, that, that we supply. You can see there's a center frequency, 433 megahertz. So that's what the ILO-1 is running. If you want one for the ILO-3, it makes sure it says 915 there, or something at least 915. Some antenna will have more different uh, frequencies that built for, so it could run both. 915 and 868 and maybe even 2.4 gigahertz. So just make sure that the one frequency that fits is 915. You can see there's a gain there on 2 dB. So that we want to use when we start calculating and it has the right connector, this SMA mail. Yeah. So here's a, an antenna here, as I showed you before, 433 with 2 dB gain. But that's that kind of antenna. If you take, for example, a Yaki antenna here, then it will give you 11 dB in gain. Now, remember the calculation from before where we said if you sent with, you know, um, um, 20 dB or 100, milli, uh, 100 milliwatts, and you uh, have an antenna like this thing here, and you don't have to have it on the sending side. In link budget, if you add the whole thing together, so you can, instead of send with 1.3 watts to get up that 11 dB, you can simply on the rate to receiver end have a Yaki antenna like that if that is what you need in order to get the last part of, of, of your communication budget to work. So that antenna here, you can see that as a difference between the 100 milliwatt and the 1.3 um, um, watts in, in, in power you have to use when you send uh, a signal like that. <coughs> then we have to look at the fresnel zone. So this is the area in between um, uh, the antenna. So you might think that, hey, I have a straight line. I can see the antenna over there, but that's not good enough. It needs like what they call a Fresnel zone. So here is uh, two houses. The antenna is seven meter above ground, a 700 meter away, and we calculate a Fresnel zone for that frequency that say, well, it has radius in the middle there of 2.8 meter. So if a bus drive through here, it stretches 80 centimeter into the Fresnel zone and it will disturb the signal. It might still be fine, but it will disturb the signal. So when you do your calculation of distance, then you have to take into consideration this Fresnel zone. Now, if you send something to a satellite up in the sky, then there's typically nothing that, that uh, blocks it. But if you want to kind of like test and see, does this thing here work over three kilometers? Uh, yeah, well, then it's not enough that you can just see the, the, the chimney over there, the mast over there, the mountain top over there. You have to make sure that the Fresnel zone, that it doesn't interfere with it, because otherwise it's not the same as when you put, put the, the satellite up in, in the sky here. So let's do the link budget. So here is a, a little, um, let's call it spreadsheet style, um, um, thing I put together to, to kind of like put the numbers in. So we have a transmission, we have a radio, and that sends with 20 dB. Now we talk dBm when it's when, when the radio and then send with dBi. Just think about it as a dB, and that's the numbers you have to add together. And then we have our receiving radio, radio here on the right hand side, minus 148. Remember, it's because we used to call it loss. So that is 148. And then we have our two antennas. They have two dB, so that's a two monopole. And then we have to calculate the loss there is when you have a cable. Now we don't have a cable, we screw it di directly in, but we put in a little bit of loss anyhow, just to be conservative in our estimation. So I put it here in brackets to five dB. And you can see the longer the cable is, it's a straight line. So the, you know, if you calculated that this cable gives you so much loss per so many meters or feet, then you can just, uh, and figure out how much will that be depending on how long the cable is. So if you, for example, have your radio in your classroom and you have an antenna on the roof, you put a cable in that length, you want to figure out how long can you have that without it disturbing the signal too much. However, the pass loss, that means between antennas, so from your ground station to your flight station, you can see that's the curve where you lose most of the, of, of, of the, of, of your link budget in the beginning. And as uh, the distance get longer and longer, it doesn't cost you necessarily much more, which is great, you know, but, but it costs a lot in, in the beginning. So, so all that we have to calculate. So 
let's jump to the browser here. So the first thing here is, and, and I have a link after that. So the first thing here is that we have to have, and I'm using, you know, because I'm not necessarily gonna remember this formula here. So I'm using a link bucket calculator. <coughs> and if you go into your Google and say link bucket calculator, you'll find many others, but let's start with this one here. So our transmit output power in dB was 20. So we put that in and our antenna was at 2 dB gain antenna. And we had a loss, see it says L here, so that's the loss. I don't have to say minus because in the formula, it's already kind of like calculated a loss. You can see the plus and minus here in the right order. So I put in five here. And then we have to free space loss. And there's another tab here to calculate that. But let me just continue here. So we have another loss here with five on the cable on the other side. We have two for the antenna and we have 148. So now it's minus 148 because it's lost that we have there. So now we have all these filled in. So now we want to calculate. So I click here on calculate here and it says free space loss. Now it, uh, you can see you can calculate in meters, kilometers here. So we're going to say uh, we want to uh, communicate the international space distance 400 kilometer away and we just want to know when it's right over our head. And of course, our satellite might not be anything to do with the International Space Station. It might just be in the same um, uh, altitude as the space station. So we say 400 kilometers. Our frequency, so if you have the ILO3, then it's 915 megahertz. And our antenna had a gain on two and two and calculate. So now we get 139, let's say 140. So we go back to this thing here and we say 140 and then we say calculate and it comes out and say well we still have 22 uh, left over in our pot here so 22 is is, is okay that's a that's a, a good um, um, good number to, to survive on of, of having a signal that goes through now <clears throat> I'm gonna come back and talk about why 400 kilometer is not enough but let me just you know, take a much bigger distance just for the sake of it. So let's say 2,500 kilometer and see what that gives. And that makes it 155, okay? So now we go in and say 155. But before I do that, that frequency is not the frequency I'm gonna fly with if I'm actually gonna put it into space. I'm gonna use the ILO one if I'm going to space because the frequency here is okay in the US, but it's not necessarily okay in ITU region one. However, ILO-1 is a frequency that is also in the frequency of the radio amateur band. So therefore we can use the ILO-1 as a radio amateur. We have to have a radio amateur license to send it, but we can use that. So that radio is now 434. Let's just say that, 434. So you see it say 155 here, and you can see by just changing the frequency to a lower frequency, it goes from 155 to 149. So now I have, I have a less of a pass loss because a lower frequency gives me a longer range. It might not look at, at, at a lot here, but you know, it's still like a number of uh, great antennas in, in, in Bifa. So I'm taking the 149, I put it in here, and you can see that should be, you know, not uh, reducing that 22 to much less than 30. So if I have like no Fresnel zone uh, in between, I can actually probably communicate using this thing here from my ground station to my satellite when it's not straight over my head. So what do I mean by that? Well, before we go there, let me just show you that these guys also have a Fresnel calculator. So here, what you can do is you can say, well, if I want to test like 400 kilometers for some reason, so you can see it's miles, or I can change it to kilometer here, so let's do that. And then my frequency is megahertz, and I say 434. I can calculate, and it will tell me that I have to have the 262 meter over the ground um, in, in free space if I want to uh, you know, communicate 400 kilometers. Now, so you can see here, and you can also see that the, according to this uh, picture here, it looks like the Earth is round. So um, you have to kind of like get used to, to that thought also. So here we have the earth curve calculator. So because of the horizon, we are in a situation where if I'm standing here, 
I can't, and the earth is round, I can't see this guy here unless he is standing high up. So we have to calculate that. So this calculator can give you this calculation. It's not any actually useful if you want to put something into, into space because then it of course fly over. But if you want to test between two points and see how far you can go, and you indeed want to test like something that's like 2,500 kilometers, then this is going to be important. So I can put it into metric and I can say, what is my eye height? So let's say I'm actually flying a balloon at five, five kilometers. And I actually want to uh, communicate 20, let's say 400 kilometers as the first. So I say calculate. And then it says, if I want to do that, then the horizon is then 200, uh, 252 kilometers away. This is this D1 here you can see. And this target here that's hidden behind the Earth's curvature have to be 1,700 meter up. So if I have a balloon of 5,000 kilometer and I want to communicate to this guy, he actually also have to be a, a balloon and be 1,700 up. And of course, I haven't even included the flexible zone yet. So it's eight o'clock, so I just want to end up with this last calculation here. So there is a place here that called Cal Sky. And on this uh, one here, you can kind of like uh, understand when I say that uh, there is a longer distance between um, your satellites. So if I click click on the International Space Station here to kind of like see where uh, is the International Space Station, and then that's a satellite. So you can look at it like um, any other satellite uh, that you want to launch altitude-wise. So in this uh, one here, I want to um, go down here and say, where is the satellite if I'm looking at it on Friday, so tomorrow here. So I'm doing a ground track. And then um, when that comes up with a calculation, you can see I'm here in Cape Town, South Africa with the XR, and there's like a flyby here. So you can see it flies every, every 90 minutes comes around. Um, so this is where it's kind of like uh, in one flight. And I can see here that it that rises, um, uh, 48 degrees over high horizon, and then it's like nearly 2,400 kilometers away. And it doesn't fly straight over my head here. So it flies over kind of like out there, um, uh, uh, you know, far away from me. And that means that the closest point, even though that it's like um, 400 kilometers from, from ground, 428 uh, kilometers from ground, then it will be 1,100 kilometers from where I'm looking at it when it's kind of like highest on the horizon. And therefore, I have to have a radio that can communicate that long because I can't be lucky enough that it flies straight over my head all the time. So Judy, um, I'm out of time. So I think what I want to do is I want to stop here and then I can continue with the rest of the presentation uh, next time of what you think about that. Let me just- yeah, um, okay. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Bianca, thank you very much. Um, we've, uh, we've only had one question that really relates to, um, to radio, and that is um, uh, if you were to fly a craft to, to Venus, um, what, what type of radio or frequency would you use? And I'm not expecting you to come up with that answer now, but maybe it's something that um, uh, we can research and then and then come back with uh, an answer uh, so, on the in the so, session on Tuesday. Yeah, so let me answer it quickly because there is actually a short answer to that. So NASA have built something they call the Deep Space Network, DSN. So they have a number of antennas and there's actually one university in USA that have an antenna that's part of the Deep Space Network uh, and not necessarily part of, um, uh, there's part of the deep net space world, but it's not controlled by NASA. And that's Moorhead State University. <clears throat> that was the last university where Bob Twix actually also um, um, lectured. Uh, you heard about Bob Twix from TED. And Moorhead State University have, uh, uh, I think it's 21 meter dish, and that's connected to the deep space network. There's also one in, uh, in, um, in Spain, and I think there's one in, uh, there's one in Australia, and we are building one here in South Africa, not um, far from where Judy and I am, it's kind of like a thousand miles from here. 
be putting up at this for the deep space network. So we're looking very much forward to that. So the way it works is that you you actually um, uh, the deep space network is kind of like the internet for space. So so the whole idea is that uh, when you send something to like Venus or Mars or, or far away, um, uh, your handheld antenna that uh, barely will reach the 400 kilometer you have to. Uh, to to your to the international space station. Never mind that if you watch satellite TV, it is going from 400 kilometers to 35,000 kilometers. That's the geostationary distance. Um, and you can imagine if we take, for example, the Moon, which is 400,000 kilometers, going to Venus, um, it's going to be somewhat uh, further away. So there is actually only one answer to that, and that is like something like the deep space network. And, and a, a, a relationship to to NASA on on using that. Um, uh, there are other um, organizations like uh, you know if China sends a satellite off and things like that, they will have their own very big dishes they use for for for, for that kind of stuff. But it's it's well beyond um, uh, anything less than a, a very big nation to communicate with that system. Great, Bjorka, thank you. We have another question from Warren, and that is. What is the maximum data rate that we can expect? In other words, kilobit per second. Yeah, so um, with, with, uh, with LoRa, you can actually tell exactly what kind of, uh, of speed you want. So it's a little, and I, I don't know how much uh, one you're aware with the QR code, but a QR code, um, if you kind of like choose a bigger QR code, you can say, I want to have a redundancy in the QR code. So if you take a QR code and you put your finger over it, you many times been able to scan it even anyhow because there's a redundancy in it. And it's the same as with LoRa. LoRa can have more or less redundancy, and the less redundancy you have, the more uh, uh, maximum speed you can get. I think it's like something like 125 kilobit per second or kilobyte per second, something like that. I, I want to come back to that, but it's a the, our radius follow the LoRa standard, so. Um, I think if you Google LoRa maximum speed, then um, you will get that. It's it's fast. Let me put it this way here. Compared to, for example, good old AMSAT, and, and which I'm going to talk about next time, where you normally have 9.6 kilobit per second, uh, and, and maybe even slightly higher, 9.2, those kind of, of, of speeds, uh, it will definitely um, be better then. Um, so, so, and that's many times the ones that have been to, to download a picture that was taken from space. Uh, obviously, when it comes to like S band and X band and those kind of receivers, you're not getting that kind of speed. But but um, from from uh, from a competition to to like an AMSAT radio, uh, Laura is definitely uh, able to to do it faster. Great, Bjarke, thank you very much. We don't have any more questions for now. Um, before we say goodbye to everybody, uh, I'd, I'd like to let everybody know that we are going to be joined on Tuesday, same time. Um, on Tuesday, we're going to be joined by Mike Miller uh, from Stoke Industries. And Mike is going to take us through um, what we need to consider uh, so that we can make sure that we can get past um, our FCC requirements. In other words, we're going to, he's going to help us with starting with the end in mind uh, when it comes to uh, designing our, our satellite payload and, and our satellite mission. So thank you 